My whole life they didn't want to. Taste the motherfucking free. You know what I'm saying? Mean? What you gonna do when you're gonna go? Sometimes, you know what I'm saying? You just gotta keep your hands pushed. You know what I'm saying? Me, the way I work is I keep operating. Because I never fail. You know what I'm saying? I fall. I pick I myself back up. I keep going. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm the mind. Fuck what happens. You, know? you can't That's take me. The There's no force it's in this world that can fucking cancel my energy. Fuck it. You know? Let's go. Yo, yo, he what? I'm back. Already twisted, no need to introduce Get lifted one line Good could rap, milk could kill a cancer Like pills pop the general, it's arsenic Retarded to the flame, go against the grain Feel the same numb pain, fuck shots, grab the bottle Getting hollow, run for cover like the day after tomorrow You can say it's chill, life's cold, but keep it real Undercover, lost the battle, but still Won the war, dark side of the force Mind trick, transform, Jedi John Connor Doing what you wanna, puffing nails Hydroponics, getting lost in the madness Sustained at the level that you practice On my own planet while I bring it back to Earth Crashing like a comet and I'm coming feet first Fuck that, already spent and it ain't no apple pie Try to tell the truth when you live it in a lie Hello and welcome to another episode of Tills from the Chris. I'm your host, Chris White, mucosal melanoma, survivor, thriver, and advocate. My podcast where we share anything and everything because it's all on the table. Uh, today we have my guest, Mrs. Stacy Sepp. This is part two of our conversation. Thank you. Two, you know, whatever. That's right. You never know really what's around the corner either. So you kind of have these ups and downs through it. Your story strikes me because you you were right into the fight immediately and it wasn't until you kind of had one of those those you know down turns where things calm down to where the emotional stuff kind of hits you um mine is a little bit different from yours because i was diagnosed initially in june of 2020 as stage two and i had surgery and um you know, they, the surgery went great. They uh, did the sentinel lymph node biopsy and that came out clear. And so they were kind of like, okay, the cancer hasn't spread. This is, this is pretty good news. Um, the, the, the thickness of my melanoma was, it was pretty intense. Um, ultimately it was eight millimeters. So they were like, you're high risk stage two. So that's kind of where my story started. You know, everything was seemingly okay. But I lost my mom to ovarian cancer now um, 12, almost 13. No, I'm sorry, in 2012. So about 10 and a half years ago, and just seeing, you know, your, your mom go through that fight. um, And ultimately, it took her, it was just, it was our worst nightmare, you know, to lose my mom, my whole family, seeing her, she was, you know, she was the glue of our family. She was like the yeah. whole family. And so, exactly. so to lose her to cancer, it was just devastating for all of us. Um, and my family is really close. So when I got my cancer diagnosis for myself, it was just, you know, my, it was my worst nightmare come true because since my mom had passed, I had spent, you know, all this time doing all these things to make sure that I was minimizing my risk of cancer in every way that I possibly could. And melanoma hit me out of nowhere. So that when, when I was first diagnosed, just thinking like the loss of my mom hit me so hard, you know, my, my whole family, my sister were really close. My dad were really close, Um, you know, to see what we all went through and to see how much it devastated us. I thought I was 35 years old when I lost my mom. I have two kids. And at the time they were what, six and nine or five and something like that. They were little. They were little. That's they what little. you call the littles, right? They have, you had littles. The littles. And to just think, oh my gosh, what, you know, what will their life be like without a mom? And you know, what will it be like for my husband to raise these kids by himself? And now I know looking back that there was a lot of PTSD from losing my mom. And so the mental health part of it, like you've kind of talked about is so significant. And it's something that doesn't really get talked about a whole lot because when you're in with your doctors, they're all focused on the physical stuff, right? They're focused on how are we going to attack this cancer? Here's what yeah. you have to do is your treatment plan. And then me exactly. Out, you've got to be alone with your thoughts. The other, you know, 
24, 23 and a half hours of the day. So what happened in, in my experience is that after I got that diagnosis, um, I went through this period of time of about two months where I literally could not sleep. It was, I've never experienced anything like that before because I've always slept like a baby. <laughs> and, you know, it, it was so, it was just so um, bizarre to not have my footing to the point where I couldn't sleep at night. And, you know, a, a long story short, what happened was over the next like five, six months, I spiraled into a really deep depression. And same as you, I'd never experienced depression before. I had yeah. no idea what was going on. This was such a foreign world. You know, I'm, I'm a pretty happy person. I'm a pretty yeah. optimistic person. But, yeah. so to, to feel these feelings for the first time, you don't, you don't really know what's going on. And you think, well, I can't have depression because it's nothing like I'm a happy. Reading. I'm a happy person. I'm a strong well, person. You, you've heard the word before, but now, you know, and heard about other people having it, but never actually like really, you know, m maybe you thought like you had a bad day or something, but not like, you know, this, you know, this is like more than just today. Oh, it's months strung together of just feeling, I mean, not being a, literally not being able to like pull yourself out of bed. And I have, I had the littles and I had a, a business that I was running. And so I, that's what got me out of bed for sure was the kids have to go to school. But I, that feeling of depression when you've never experienced it before was so, um, gosh, it was just so foreign and it was really uh, just discombobulating. You know, it's, it's just a really strange thing. Um, and it was also this, how I felt was nothing like I was reading online about the symptoms of depression. I just was like, that's not really what I'm feeling. It's so it can't be that. And so you start thinking, okay, what's wrong with me? So it's something different is something different. So like six months after my diagnosis, it got to a point where the depression was more of an issue for me than the cancer. I'd kind of put the cancer on a back burner and the depression really became what was the, the big issue in my life that I had to deal with. You got to fix this before you can fix that. Yeah. And so, um, you know, thank, thank God I have family. I like you family around me, really good friends that are like family who you know, they, they knew what was going on. It got to a really low point and um, they helped me dig my way out of that. And I did all kinds of different things. You know, I think people um, find whatever resources work for them. And for me, it was constant check-ins with my friends and family. I mean, I had friends that were calling me every single day, texting me every single day. I was going to therapy pretty regularly. And I was also doing um, spiritual counseling because the spiritual part of it was a big component for me. Um, and so I, you know, people need to just, I, I just had the, the feeling of like, I've got to do everything. I've got to do all the things so that I can, you know, crawl my way back to who I used to be for, for my kids and for my family and for, you know, all the people who, who love me and who have helped me through this whole thing. So over the next like five or six months, I really spent a ton of time just working on my mental health and getting myself back to a place where I felt steady on my feet and, you know, um, had to start exercising again. I'd exercised for 20 years prior to all of this and I just stopped. And so that I think was also a factor in like what was going on in my body. And how Less movement, right? Yeah. Less movement. Yeah. I told, yeah, that's a huge, that I, I was, you know, it's exact the people like the just being a busy body, you're not a busy body, but being mobile, you know, you don't realize how much, cause 
my, all my jobs, you know, even when I, before I was a home builder, I worked in and out of the uh, Glen Eagles Country Club for like 10 years and I was for the golf I department. The so, you know, it was nonstop. And so it was like, I, I, I tried office jobs, you know, I tried, I was a recruiter for a year and a half, got fired because definitely, yeah, I was happy to be fired actually, went back to the country club, <laughs> you know, um, yeah. worked in oil and gas for like eight months, but 2008 economy hit, but it didn't matter because I was happy. I went back to the country club, you know, it was, you know, it was like, okay, I have an office you know and so it was like i i just uh that it's it's par like it, it becomes paralyzing because for somebody that's so used to moving around and then now you can't you'd like literally the whole staying in bed thing like yeah i mean it's like there's days you don't get out of your room you don't leave your house like it was a beautiful day you heard but it, i didn't even step outside to see it that's right well not to mention yeah all of this um was going down during covid and so um, I was, I was 2020. In June, 2020. You said June 20. Oh my God. Yeah. I, so it my. was like, we couldn't, we couldn't do the things that we used to do. We couldn't go to the gym and go to our classes and do all that stuff that we used to do with our friends, you know? So I think that that really took a toll. My husband would tell me, yeah. he's like, oh, you're missing all this stuff. And I was like, no, it's fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. And you don't realize the connection what's happening to you. And you don't realize the connection that you, that you've lost, you know, these connections with, with the world. Um, so yeah, it took me a good, I mean, it, it took me like four or five months to get myself really back to where I was before all of that, you know, the diagnosis and the depression and everything like that. Um, and <laughs> right at that time that I was really feeling back to who I, who I was previously was when I found out that it had metastasized and I was stage four. Oh, so no. it was kind of like this whole thing of like, that was when I was ready to, like you said, flip the switch. I was like, okay, I've gone through all of this for a reason, you know, and thankfully, I'm at a point where I'm feeling really strong now and ready to take on whatever comes my way. So that was August of 2021. And I learned that I was stage four and I had to, you know, I went for a um, second opinion at MD Anderson and, you know, was weighing all these different treatment options, different clinical trials through UCH here in, in Denver. Um, and then a, a clinical trial that was offered through MD Anderson. And I finally decided, you know what, I just want to stay home because I want to be able to get treatment and then go home to my family and, and my, you know, my house and all the comforts that are there. I want to be yeah. able to take the kids to school and all that stuff. So I decided to stay here for treatment, which was, a, you know, it's certainly a, an amazing thing to have a, hospital and doctors like they have at um university of colorado hospital. oh god god bless them you know i love them i'm big fans <laughs> you know all about I'm them all about them Which yes they are lifesavers they're they're life they're literal lifesavers yeah so stayed here for treatment found out in january of 2022 that it had that it was working and um Immediately, I found that out in January. I had a scan again in early March, and I found out I had um, made even more progress. So the tumors were shrinking even more. And that's when I was like, you know what? Kind of like you, I've got to do something with this. Like, some, there's some reason why I've gone through all of this, both the mental health struggle and then also the, this, you know, cancer itself. And so I jumped right in. It was right when Advocacy Days was happening. It was still virtual at that time. Oh, okay, yeah. In 2022. March, yeah, that's, so yeah. Early March of 2022 and jumped right in with the MRF, who you and I are both very active with, the Melanoma Research Foundation, and yep. got involved with Advocacy Days. And, um, you know, it's just this feeling of like, okay, we know how fortunate we are to have made it through to where we are now, you know, I've got to do something with this. I've got to, I've got to do something positive with all this that I've just gone through to, to help others. So um, yeah. And then you and I met through the MRF at advocacy days this year. So um, 
yeah, that's, that's kind of, you know, my journey. And really the mental health part of it is, was a big, big part of mine, but I'm glad that I had gone through the struggle when I did so that whenever it was ready for me to, to do treatment and fight stage four, I was, I felt really ready to do that. So definitely want to, um, once you found out that it metastasized and you were like, the whole switch got flipped, you know, like, okay, now I got to do something. Yeah. Um, was it like a feeling of like, I, now I'm mad. Now I'm pissed. You cancer, like it's going down. All right. We're going to see, you know, I mean, did you get into that? Like, I'm, I mean, just that you have to get um, mad mode. You have to get mad yeah. at the cancer and be like, I, you know, you know, I've been, you know, been in the service, but I'm going to war, you know, yeah. and, you know, yeah. know your enemy. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, shut up. Um, yeah, and that 100%. was, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, literally like, you know, it's uh, not only that, but it's, um, you know, what did I, they don't, they don't know what causes my cancer. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it is a melanoma, but it only makes up 1% of melanomas because it forms in mucous membranes. You know, I thought I seriously had a hemorrhoid. I mean, I'd never had one, be a hemorrhoid before, but anything growing on the rim of your rectum, you know, you think, well, that's probably a hemorrhoid. So I seriously, I mean, like as it was going, it started to grow like a couple months into it. I'm with my buddy on a ski lift, you know, going snowboarding going, oh, man, you know, ski lifts, you know, so now I got this hemorrhoid, you know, this kind of thing going on my butt, you know, I should get it, you know, you know, and it was, and then it wasn't, it got it just slowly continued to get bigger, it wasn't bothering me or nothing, and I was just always with, oh, yeah, I'll go get a check later, I'll get a check later, you know, um, I'm busy, uh, da, 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 and then it's not until this lump grows in my groin the size of a golf ball, and I'm like, okay, okay uh you know to go to get checked so what, going on? what was going on in my head even prior to cancer to i was like i put that off and it was just like the priority of my mindset of like make money because that's you know i gotta go to work you know don't want to miss you know i need to do this you know what i mean like my health right. was not a priority and so um <laughs> what uh so, if you don't know what causes it, you just start researching cancer in general, like what it feeds on and this and that. And so just, you know, health wise and everything, you know, think about all the like just processed like food and crap, you know, that's like everywhere now. And it's like literally over the last like hundred or so years, you know, everything's become so processed and just non, you know, what it used to be that like, no wonder like the rates of all the cancer and disease are what they are. And so, you know, and there's new cancers and different things popping up and that way they have to come up with new drugs and and so, you know, health wise, I just, I, I never, you know, was intentional about putting healthy food in my body, but, you know, I was just so active, so I didn't think it mattered, you know, and then actually okay. before I got diagnosed with, um, with, with all my, with everything, I started taking juice plus my mom's been was an affiliate member or still is an affiliate member and uh she was like oh you know start taking some of these but then when i got diagnosed i ended up taking you know getting all four of the different capsules and i started like just doubling tripling up on that and then just really looked into my diet you know and figured out yeah. what i could eat what i couldn't eat well you know if i was gonna not be in a spot where you know, things were, I was not going to have an appetite. What could I still eat on? And, you know, literally with, you know, within a few months of my diagnosis, but within a month of knowing my metastasis, you know, I, I, I boxed up everything, put it in storage and moved in with my parents and lived with my mom. And, you know, we just came up with a, with a, with a diet plan, you know, of like, right. What you know, so you could sustain the weight in case you need to lose it from some other treatment. I actually I gained weight during all my treatment up until my treatment caused me colitis. You know, like it's the first time I ever had weight. Immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. Well, immunotherapy, chemo, um, radiation, and surgery. I had all those before. Yeah. You know, I ended up doing six rounds of the Ipi Nevo combo. You know, um, and I around. I know that's crazy. It's so, you know. Um, like, and it's not my doctor's fault, you know, but I mean, I, I kind of played it off. Like it was cool. Like I knew I was sick, you know, um, I knew I had colitis, but I mean, I still got like my sixth infusion. I mean, I did the first two infusions and then, um, you know, we were scanning for something else and I knew how to another progression and things were just looking real bad. And we knew that immunotherapy takes a while to kick in, but we needed something immediate. So, um, I started doing a CVD chemo and, you know, in conjunction with radiation to kind of, you know, stabilize and slow things down, which we did. 
Then I went back to the immunotherapy. But and while I was waiting on that, I did a dose of Keytruda just, you know, because the plan was, but there wasn't approved. So my doctor actually just ate the cost and she's so cool. <laughs> and so I, uh, but yeah. And so I, and so instead of starting a number three, when I went back to Ipinevo, they started and they called it number one. And so, and then I did four more. And Which is um, insane because of most people, they, yeah. You know, I don't remember the statistic off the top of my head, well, but most people don't make it through four. So most people don't make it. Well, well I know. <laughs> I uh, part of my uh, one of my support groups through Facebook that you know on a Zoom calls we were on, you know, and, and stuff like that. Just through that group, there's so many people that get colitis, and they they usually get it pretty quickly, you know, if they're gonna get it and stuff. But I, you know, yeah, it, but it put me out for like three months. You know, um, I, and three plus months, you know, going in and out of the taper program of the whole uh, prednisone oh, battle, you yes. know, and trying to, yeah, I, you know, we so, both know that well. You, you know, so eventually I had to figure out my own taper program, you know, because I ended up in the hospital for a week after the first taper program failed. And then on, when the second program failed, um, I, I, instead of going into the hospital, that's when I got the nutrition pack hooked up to my port for two weeks and went back up to the prednisone so after you know after that i came up with the own program but i knew i wasn't getting any any uh any treatment and so i was like well uh but i did so much that you know over such a short period of time that it kind of stabilized so when i got done with that it wasn't going back to immunotherapy it was going back to to chemo and so but it was a different chemo i did a braxin and um you know until we could figure something out and then it wasn't until after that um, I was going in and scanning and they were like, you know, it's, it's kind of stable, but still getting worse. And, you know, your options are running thin. So, you know, you got two options and ones to do, they're calling it a clinical trial by doing, um, Keytruda plus a chemo. Um, and I think it was Ibrance. Um, and then the, uh, the other option was to do till. And